Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, for our final formal lecture of the day, we have Dr. Peter Klein from the University of Missouri, uh, who has a new book out on the topic of this lecture, Entrepreneurship. Peter? Thank you, Mark. Uh, it's great to see all of you here, especially since this is the last slot uh, before the dinner hour. Uh, I certainly didn't ask to be assigned this particular speaking slot. Uh, I like to be at the very front of the line uh, to get ahead of all the greedy people. But <clears throat> <laughs> that may not work today. Um, as, uh, as Mark Thornton mentioned uh, yesterday, this is the 25th anniversary of the Mises University. And uh, I attended my very first Mises University back in 1988, a very long time ago. Um, it was a fantastic experience for me, one that I'll always remember, uh, getting to see uh, these famous professors, uh, the writers, the people whose work I had read and whose uh, ideas I had studied, getting to meet them uh, and hear from them in person, people like Murray Rothbard and Walter Block and Joe Salerno and Roger Garrison and so on. Um, it was a great uh, thrill to meet them in person. I mean, I'd been reading uh, Salerno for years. Uh, my grandfather had told me about uh, Salerno's lectures uh, that he had listened to. <laughs> so I sort, of, I sort of grew up with, uh, grew, grew up with that. Uh, but no, I, I, not only did I attend in 88, but I, I've attended every Mises University since 1988. So that's, what, 20, 22 editions of Mises University. And, you know, I think from listening to the lectures uh, every year, meeting all the different people, the great scholars who have come to share their ideas, I think I'm finally starting to get it. <laughs> I was listening to uh, Dr. Hulsman uh, last night and I you was know, sitting there thinking, let's see, human action, so people, people act in the market. Oh, yeah, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> The light bulb came on. And, um, but th this afternoon, I want to talk to you about a specific aspect of human action, uh, namely the human action that's embodied in the entrepreneur. So today's lecture deals with entrepreneurship at a very general level. And then throughout the rest of the week, we'll be talking about other specific manifestations of the entrepreneurial function, entrepreneurship in different contexts. Um, now, you might wonder why why we have a lecture on entrepreneurship so early in the program, it may seem to many of you like a fairly specialized esoteric topic. Why is it right at the beginning along with fundamentals of action and capital theory and uh, the business cycle and so on? Well, what I hope to convince you of by the end of this lecture is that entrepreneurship is indeed as fundamental and as essential to the understanding of economics as any of the core concepts that make up the Austrian tradition. Now, it so happens this is a good time to be talking about entrepreneurship uh, uh, to, to a group like you guys because uh, entrepreneurship has become such a popular topic, not only in mainstream academia, but in the policy world, among business practitioners, uh, international agencies, and so on. Um, Indeed, many people have remarked uh, that, uh, that we're in the middle of sort of a, an entrepreneurship phenomenon or an entrepreneurship research and teaching phenomenon. You have uh, many, many classes, not only in business schools, uh, but also elsewhere in the universities, in, in, uh, in engineering, in medicine, in journalism, even in arts and sciences. Uh, there are many, many courses and programs devoted to the study of entrepreneurship. Uh, on the research side, there is a whole set of specialized academic journals uh, devoted to applied entrepreneurship studies. Uh, you know, they look and feel like uh, other mainstream economics journals with regression tables and uh, 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 mathematical uh, formal theories and so on. You have um, many centers and institutes at universities and elsewhere. Uh, the, here are the logos of institutions at Stanford, at the University of Illinois, uh, at MIT, that are devoted to the study of entrepreneurship, promoting entrepreneurship, um, entrepreneurship among students and others. Um, uh, there are a number of organizations that are providing research funding for applied studies of entrepreneurship. The Kauffman Foundation in Kansas City 
fairly close to me in, in, in Missouri, is uh, one of the leading funders of, of scholarly research in applied entrepreneurship. Um, you know, even in the policy world, you have uh, the phenomenon of microfinance, microenterprise. Uh, here's a picture of Muhammad Yunus, uh, who won the Nobel Pre Peace Prize uh, last year uh, for work that he has done in uh, Bangladesh and elsewhere on uh, uh, helping very, very poor uh, people uh, start companies. Uh, some observers characterized this as sort of the Nobel Prize for entrepreneurship, even though it was the Nobel Peace Prize, on the grounds that technical economic theory uh, would not have a, an entrepreneurship Nobel Prize, at least not for some time. Um, you know, but what exactly is it that these organizations are funding? What is it that these courses are teaching? What is it that the entrepreneurship phenomenon within the mainstream academic and policy communities is really all about? Well, if you ask people to describe an entrepreneur or to characterize entrepreneurship, what are the kinds of things that come to mind? Well, usually they think of the technology sector and maybe you know, someone like, uh, uh, like Bill Gates or there's uh, Steve Wozniak or maybe Steve Jobs. Uh, these are uh, uh, individuals who have uh, brought new technologies to the market, have created new enterprises, made a lot of money for themselves, and also created a lot of economic value for consumers, for shareholders. We think of them as entrepreneurs. Maybe we think of great inventors like Thomas Edison or great industrialists like uh, John D. Rockefeller as being entrepreneurs. Often we think of particular companies Right? We think of Google or Apple or 3M being entrepreneurial organizations or entrepreneurial companies. The idea being other companies, more mature, more established companies, typically outside of the technology sector, are somehow not entrepreneurial firms. They're a different kind of firm somehow. Right? Um, people have written books on uh, uh, culture and society, you can't see these in the back, there's a book by a, a leading entrepreneurship scholar, David Audrish, called The Entrepreneurial Society, that compares uh, R&D and innovation policy among various OECD countries. Uh, there's a book by uh, three scholars associated with the Kauffman Foundation called Good Capitalism, Bad Capitalism, that's a pretty good read, um, uh, that came out about two years ago. Uh, arguing that uh, what public policy should promote is more entrepreneurial kinds of uh, economic activity. That the US, uh, the EU, parts of Asia, for example, have, kind of, have a more entrepreneurial kind of capitalism, whereas elsewhere uh, in, in, in the world you have a more bureaucratic form of capitalism. So the word entrepreneurial is sometimes applied to an economic system meaning something that's more creative, more dynamic, more innovative than an older, uh, sort of more ossified economic system. So as you notice, you know, th th there are many different concepts of what an entrepreneur is, what entrepreneurship is, what role it plays in society. And it's often very difficult, indeed confusing, as you read the mainstream economics literature on entrepreneurship to figure out what the heck they're talking about. Because lots and lots of writers use the same word to mean very, very different things. Now, the way Austrian economists have thought about entrepreneurship, have thought about the entrepreneur, is in a way very different from the notions of entrepreneurship we get in the mainstream literature. And I think it might be useful to distinguish two different ways of thinking about entrepreneurship. The first would be entrepreneurship as a phenomenon entrepreneurship as a particular distinct economic phenomenon to be studied using economic analysis. The second perspective is that entrepreneurship is sort of a fundamental, inherent, intrinsic, essential part of all economic activity or behavior. So is entrepreneurship a specialized activity or is entrepreneurship something that's much more general? Let's take each of these in turn. What I mean by the mainstream perspective of entrepreneurship as a distinct phenomenon is the idea that, well, just as economics can be used to study labor unions or international trade agreements or industrial structure, monopoly policy, you know, just as you have a number of applied fields in economics, entrepreneurship is just another one of those applied fields. Okay, so we can have the economics of the entrepreneur or the economics of entrepreneurship as a specialized 
field course, just as we might have the economics of monetary policy or the economics of, uh, of health care or something like this. Um, what, what is the phenomenon that this approach to entrepreneurship is presumably concerned with? Well, it's things like self-employment. Why do some individuals choose to work for themselves as opposed to working for established enterprises? Uh, startups or startup companies. What explains the number of startup companies in a particular place or time? Which individuals will choose to start new companies? Which individuals will work for existing companies? Uh, it could be a kind of small business management. What kind of accounting or marketing or uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, sales, sales policy is appropriate for a small company as opposed to a big one? It might be the study of introducing new products and services. So the idea here is that you just take mainstream economic analysis that, you're, that most of you are familiar with, and instead of applying it to labor unions or whatever, you just apply it to self-employment and startups. That constitutes entrepreneurship studies, according to more or less what I would call the mainstream perspective in economics departments and in business schools. So, you know, you can read a book about entrepreneurship, you can learn entrepreneurship for dummies just as you might learn, you know, fishing for dummies or something like that, any other sort of specialized activity. Um, now, this is very different from the perspective one gets from reading not only the Austrians, but also sort of the classic economic contributors to the study of entrepreneurship over, over many, many years. Um, reading Mises, one gets the notion of entrepreneurship as a very general or uh, an intrinsic aspect of human behavior, a particular way of thinking about human decision making of, indeed, human action. Now, there's kind of a broader and a narrower way to think about this. But by the way, for those of you craning your necks to try to see the slides, if you can't see in the bottom, the slides will be made available to you on Mises.org. So don't worry about jotting things down if you can't see what's on the bottom of the slides. Uh, it, the slides will be available for you to download and print out later at your leisure. Um, what I have in mind here is uh, two different notions of this generalized uh, entrepreneurial function, sort of a broader one and a narrower one. The broader one is simply the notion of decision-making under conditions of uncertainty. Decision-making under uncertainty. This is the most general notion of entrepreneurial behavior. It's another way of characterizing how human beings attempt to use scarce means or resources to achieve particular ends that they desire. Okay? There's also kind of a narrower definition, a more historically contingent definition uh, of the entrepreneur or entrepreneurship as uh, the, the arrangement of tangible resources of capital goods, physical capital goods, and also the use of financial capital to try to earn profits, to earn money profit. So what we think of as sort of the business person is an entrepreneur in this narrower sense, uh, not simply of acting under uncertainty, but acting under uncertainty in a particular way by acquiring, combining, and deploying capital resources in an attempt to produce consumer goods that can be sold at a profit. Let's talk about each of these notions in turn in just a little bit more detail. Start with this general or broader concept of entrepreneurship as action or decision making under conditions of uncertainty. Right? Well, it, this, this concept builds on some of the uh, most basic starting points of theorizing in the Austrian tradition. For example, the notion of means and ends that comes right out of Menger's Principles of Economics, published in 1871. Right, that human action is about the achievement of particular ends or goals, uh, what Mises calls the removal of felt uneasiness, but that human beings must employ scarce means to achieve these goals. Right, and there are a number of implications that you're, that you're familiar with. Uh, the notions of oppor uh, cost, cost as opportunity costs, uh, decision makers facing trade-offs among alternative uses of scarce means to achieve desired ends. We also have the notions of time and uncertainty. Namely, that human action does not take place in some sort of uh, you know, idealized theoretical vacuum, right? but under conditions of real time. 
So human action takes time, meaning we have to make decisions about how to employ our means in, in anticipation of satisfying certain ends. But we don't know at the moment that those means are employed for sure whether they will in fact satisfy our ends. We might be pleased with our actions, but we might also be frustrated and disappointed. That leads to the notion of more generally success and failure, or in a more uh, a narrow economic concept, catalactic concept, profit and loss. Right, so if I'm able to achieve the ends that I desire uh, using the means that I have employed, if I'm successful, then I realize some kind of gain, right? Call it, call it uh, psychic satisfaction or utility, if you like. Uh, if I'm frustrated, if I find that I was unable to achieve my goals, I made an error, I chose the wrong means, or I combined means in the wrong way, uh, I end up unhappy, unsatisfied, frustrated. I've suffered a kind of a loss, a psychic loss, if you like. Okay? Now, it turns out that thinking about entrepreneurship in this very general way of making decisions about uh, allocating resources under conditions of uncertainty goes way back to the very first systematic treatment of entrepreneurship in the economics literature. That found in the great treatise of Richard Cantillon, or Cantillon, if you prefer the French pronunciation, uh, the, the essay on the nature of commerce in general, which was published in 1755, though presumed to have been written uh, several decades earlier, probably around 1730. And I'll just read you a, qu a quote from Cantillon's great treatise, which is, which is really the first systematic treatise in economic science. Uh, Cantillon writes as follows, talking, he's talking about different classes of economic agent and different categories of income that these agents can earn. Cantillon writes the following. He says, entrepreneurs work for uncertain wages, so to speak, and all others for certain wages until they have them, although their functions and rank are very disproportionate. The general who has a salary, the courtier who has a pension, and the domestic who has wages are in the latter class, meaning those are uh, people who work for certain wages until they have them. All the others, Cantillon continues, are entrepreneurs, uh, whether they establish themselves with a capital to carry on their enterprise, or are entrepreneurs of their own work without any capital, and they may be considered as living subject to uncertainty. Even beggars and robbers are entrepreneurs of this class. In other words, those who receive a guaranteed income, a steady stream of income, such as a wage earner, or a landlord who earns rent uh, that is paid by tenants, is, uh, is one category of labor. But everyone whose income is uncertain, a farmer whose, uh, whose proceeds depend on uh, crop yields and, and market prices, uh, a highwayman whose proceeds depend on which, you know, rich people wander through the forest and you know, can be, uh, can be uh, kidnapped or whatever. Uh, they all are entrepreneurs in the sense that they have to make decisions about future gains that are not at all realized for sure. Okay? Uh, the way Mises puts it uh, in human action is the following. The term entrepreneur as used by economic theory, in other words, the, the, the general fundamental function of the entrepreneur in the economy means acting man exclusively seen from the aspect of the uncertainty inherent in every action. The term entrepreneur as used by economic theory means acting man exclusively seen from the aspect of the uncertainty inherent in every action. So whether one is you know, a businessman as we would commonly use that term or not, whenever one is employing resources under conditions of uncertainty, in pursuit of ends that may or may not be realized, one is acting as an entrepreneur in this sense. Now, you might wonder, uh, well, so, so an obvious implication of this is that all action, all human action, contains, if you like, a measure of entrepreneurship. All human action is entrepreneurial in this sense. Now, you might be wondering, uh, uh, sorry, Okay, uh, sorry, let, let's, let's continuing to think about this pure function of the entrepreneur. Notice that the function is distinct, as Cantillon explained, from other functions in the, in the economic system. 
right? So laborers, the income that accrues to laborers is what we call wages, right? Uh, landowners earn rents, payments for the use of their land that are made, that are made by others. Uh, capitalists earn interest by making their capital available to others in, 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 uh, in the present uh, in, 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 in exchange for getting a repayment in the future with an additional payment, an interest payment. What the entrepreneur earns is not a wage or a rent or interest, but rather profit or, if the entrepreneur is unsuccessful, loss. So profit and loss are, dis are, are distinct income categories that are different from wages and rents and interest. Now, as I mentioned before, profit or loss could be measured in monetary terms, in dollar terms or euro terms or whatever, but they could also be measured subjectively as intangibles, as a kind of uh, satisfaction or frustration if we're talking outside a monetary context. Now, you might think, oh, oh, and by the way, note that profit is also not sort of a, not a rate. It's not an automatic rate of return that accrues to the business, the businessman, right? This is what sort of, uh, you know, uh, mainstream critics of, of profit or mainstream, uh, mainstream critics of business, people in the media and, and government and so on, you know, they act as if profit is something that just is sort of automatically generated. Right, so one decides to go into business to be a business person and merely by going through certain motions, you know, the profit just comes in. And so politicians will say, well, you know, no one should earn a profit more than 3% or 5%. We should tax the rest away because it's excess profit or something, right? I mean, there's no concept here of kind of a normal rate of profit. I mean, the, the normal rate of profit, if that means anything, it would be zero, okay? So anytime uh, an acting man can achieve returns that he values more highly than, the, than what he paid out uh, um, in, 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 in means, right? The entrepreneur has realized to gain some kind of a profit, but there's nothing at all automatic or certain about a profit in that sense, right? Now, you, you might be wondering, well, you know, robbers and highwaymen and, you know, even uh, the housewife who goes to the market not knowing for sure if there will be bread on sale that day, if, if we apply the term entrepreneur to those people, aren't we defining it so broadly that it doesn't really do anything for us, right? I mean, what are the scarce means that people like that are employing? <laughs> They're not investing huge amounts of money. They don't own big factories and machines that can be deployed to alternative uses. Well, they do have some means, and those means are scarce, right? I mean, uh, a, a workman who owns his own tools, you know, if the highwayman owns his own sword or bow and arrow or whatever he uses, I mean, those are tools of the trade, right, that can be invested in in alter, uh, to alternative uses as opposed to the ones they're, they're uh, at present. You know, the opportunity cost of one's time is a resource, a scarce resource that can be invested in one activity or another. And indeed, one's own body is a kind of resource, right, that one invests under conditions of uncertainty in deciding to, you know, walk down the right side of the street as opposed to the left side of the street, okay? Now, as Mises notes, this very broad notion of entrepreneurial action is not necessarily the, the one that we use in everyday discourse. Uh, Mises writes in Human Action, he says, the economic concept entrepreneur, meaning what we're talking about now, belongs, pull the curtain back here to reveal the little man behind the curtain so I can read it. Uh, <laughs> the economic concept entrepreneur belongs to a stratum other than the ideal type entrepreneur as used by economic history and descriptive economics. In other words, when we say, talk historically about the entrepreneur, meaning Bill Gates or John D. Rockefeller, we have something in mind that's, that's a, an application or a manifestation of the pure concept, but is more than simply the theoretical construct of the entrepreneur. Mises continues, nobody, uh, nobody in using it, in using the term, term entrepreneur, thinks of shoeshine boys, cab drivers who own their cars, small businessmen and small farmers, Nonetheless, what economics establishes with regard to entrepreneurs is rigidly valid for all members of the class without any regard to the temporal and geographical conditions and to the various branches of business. In other words, any economic actor who is employing scarce means in anticipation of uncertain rewards is acting as an entrepreneur. 
However, Mises recognizes that there is, a, there is value in defining an alternative concept of entrepreneurship that is a bit more narrow and specific. Okay? This is what Mises calls the promoter or the entrepreneur promoter. Mises writes, uh, quote, he says, he recognizes that, uh, that economists have used the term entrepreneur in various ways. And he writes that economics, quote, also calls entrepreneurs those who are especially eager to profit from adjusting production to the expected changes and conditions, those who have more initiative, more initiative than average, more venturesomeness, and a quicker eye than the crowd, the pushing and promoting pioneers of economic improvement. Mises notes that this particular type of business person, this particular kind of market actor who is especially aware or alert to opportunities in the environment, who has more initiative, who has what Mises calls venturesomeness, is sort of willing to take on a new venture, um, a quicker eye than the crowd. Mises says, well, we often think of this type of person as being an entrepreneur. But indeed, uh, this is a more, a, a sort of a narrower, more specialized use of the term. To avoid terminological confusion, Mises suggests a different word. And the word he comes up with is promoter. He says, a person like this is a subset of all entrepreneurs, what Mises calls a promoter or an entrepreneur promoter. Now, I'm not entirely sure that this Mises' attempt at terminological innovation is entirely successful. I mean, you know, the word promoter is also sometimes used uh, in, in other contexts. <laughs> Nonetheless, I'll use the word promoter or entrepreneur promoter <laughs> the way that Mises does. Um, what, what he has in mind is an individual with the following characteristics. Someone who owns and invests capital, financial, or, and or physical capital, a business person, an investor, a financier who employs res physical resources and financial resources to try to make money, okay? To try to make money by transforming these resources into consumer goods that can be bought and sold in markets. Uh, th this promoter performs economic calculation, an extremely important concept that we'll be discussing all week. Uh, we often think of um, uh, economic calculation, specifically in the context of socialism. And as Professor Hulsman pointed out last night, uh, Mises' great treatise on socialism was the first to, to explain systematically that under common governmental ownership of the means of production, entrepreneurs would not, uh, decision makers would not have access to money prices for factors of production, could not engage in cost accounting, and would be unable to allocate uh, the society's resources to their most highly valued uses. But notice, Mises assumed that the concept of economic calculation was something that was used everywhere, uh, was something that is used in the market economy, right? So the socialist economy cannot do what a capitalist economy can do, namely perform economic calculation. And by this we mean simply the comparison of expected future receipts and present outlays in terms of a common unit, in terms of a common unit, right? The, the problem with thinking of sort of profit and loss as purely psychic or subjective is that it's, it's very ambiguous, right? I mean, you know, I, I, uh, I, I chose to, 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 go, to go to the movies last night instead of, uh, you know, going bowling. Uh, you know, did I earn a profit or a loss? Well, I mean, you know, I had some idea in my mind of how much satisfaction I would get from seeing this particular movie as opposed to some other movie or as opposed to some other activity. And, you know, after you see a movie, you think, eh, that was pretty good or, or that was great or oh, that movie, you know, that movie sucked or whatever, right? I mean, it's very difficult, it's indeed impossible to quantify <laughs> the degree of success that one had with one's investment of time and one's own body. Right, so for the business person, these just sort of warm, fuzzy feelings about success or failure are not adequate. The business person needs real numbers, and those real numbers in a monetary economy are provided by prices, right? So the, the entrepreneur acting in the market, 
the promoter entrepreneur has the ability to compare outlays and receipts in a common unit, in, in, in a monetary unit, and know whether one exceeds the other. Okay? Know whether he has earned a profit or a loss. That's what economic, that is economic calculation. Not only can it not be performed under socialism, but it's essential that it be performed the right way under capitalism. Uh, this promoter entrepreneur is especially alert to opportunities for profit in the environment, exhibits creativity and leadership, is able to motivate uh, 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 his or her fellow, fellow man or woman. Uh, notice, and Mises points this out, that uh, the, the notion of the promoter is sort of a more loosely defined and historically contingent concept than that of the pure functional entrepreneur acting man under uncertainty. That can be defined, acting man under uncertainty can be defined with great precision in Mises' system of praxeology. Whereas the promoter is more of a kind of empirical historical concept that cannot be defined quite so precisely, but yet is extremely useful as we think about how a market economy works. Um, now, let me say a word or two about the relationship between the entrepreneur and the entrepreneurial function and the function of the capitalist. Because there's, uh, uh, these are distinct yet very closely related concepts uh, in the Misesian system. Uh, notice that under conditions of uncertainty, that capital owners actually earn two distinct kinds of income. They earn two different types of return, right? A capitalist who allows his or her capital to be used in anticipation of producing, to, to produce consumer goods that will only materialize and be delivered and sold to consumers in the future, earns an interest return as a reward for giving up the use of those resources in the present. Okay, so lending out capital earns one, the, the reward for lending out one's capital is interest, but if the exact returns from that loan are uncertain, right, whether the consumer goods will be desirable, whether they'll be successful, how much consumers will be willing to pay, whether those receipts will sum to more than the value of the uh, expenditures on factors of production, right, that's not known with certainty. So if it turns out that there is a money profit left over that is returned to the investor, that part of the return is, is profit. So in addition to or separate from interest, a capitalist also earns profit or loss, assuming that the returns are not known with certainty, okay? So the capitalist acts as an entrepreneur, as an entrepreneur promoter under conditions of uncertainty while also receiving an interest return. So it's, this suggests some subtlety uh, in the relationship between the capitalist and the entrepreneurial function. Now, I would argue that as we think about the firm, the business firm in a market economy, and by the way, we have a whole lecture tomorrow on the theory of production and the theory of the firm, uh, a useful way to think about uh, the business firm as, is that it lies at the intersection of the capitalist and the entrepreneur functions. The business firm is all about the intersection, the interaction between the capitalist and the entrepreneur. Now, it just so happens that there's an outstanding recent book that deals with the relationship between the capitalist and the entrepreneur. Uh, it's called The Capitalist and the Entrepreneur, Essays on Organizations and Markets, and I would highly recommend it to you. You can purchase copies in the bookstore downstairs. You might even be able to get them autographed. Um, the argument, <laughs> for a price, uh, the argument that's, that's offered in the book is that we can take uh, is that we can, we can uh, uh, generate a, a uniquely Austrian approach to the business firm, an Austrian theory of the firm, uh, by combining the modern economic literature on organizations with the Austrian concepts of entrepreneurship and capital. So if we, we take uh, entrepreneurship as we've been discussing it today, uh, add Austrian capital theory, and integrate some ideas from modern organizational economics, we have a robust and extremely useful uh, concept or theory of the business firm. And so we'll be talking about this theory of the firm a little bit tomorrow. It can address questions such as, why do firms exist in the first place? Why do entrepreneurs establish firms? 
Why do they aggregate particular human and non-human resources into these particular bundles that we call business firms, as opposed to producing goods and services through some other means? Uh, what determines the size and shape of firms? How should firms be organized? Why are some firms more successful than others? Or in modern management jargon, what, is the, so is, you know, the, what, what generates competitive advantage for particular uh, firms or economic actors? These are all questions that we can address by thinking about the intersection between the capitalist and the entrepreneur. And we'll do some of that tomorrow. Um, now, I, I, I want to mention that uh, the Austrian literature on the entrepreneur is actually fairly diverse and heterogeneous. Uh, there are a number, of different, uh, a number of different perspectives on entrepreneurs that are offered in the entrepreneurship literature. Uh, and e each one has distinct attributes, and it's useful to spend a moment or two pointing some of those out. Um, probably the best known modern Austrian economist working in the entrepreneurship area, uh, besides me, is uh, Israel Kirzner. Uh, who was mentioned last night in Professor Hulsman's talk, uh, is a retired professor, taught for many years at New York University, received his PhD under Mises, and uh, Kirzner in a number of works, starting with his best known book published in 1973 called Competition and Entrepreneurship, has articulated a particular perspective on the entrepreneur, emphasizing the notion of alertness. The essence of the entrepreneurial function in Kirzner's formulation is awareness of, or alertness of, or the recognition of particular opportunities that exist in a world of disequilibrium. So in a world, in an economy, in which all prices are not at their long-run equilibrium values, there are gains to be had from engaging in various forms of arbitrage, buying low and selling high, right, as in a commodity market speculator, or as in a business person, who acquires resources, uh, factors of production, at a price below what they would have commanded if everyone in the economy had known just how valuable these resources are. So the, uh, the, the, the business person in Kirzner's formulation is exploiting sort of a gap in the market, uh, in a sense is earning an arbitrage profit by buying resources and turning them into consumer goods, which can be sold in the future. Now, uh, Kirzner's emphasis on alertness is clearly drawn out of Mises, and you might recognize uh, a, a relationship to Mises' notion of the promoter. Right? One, of the key, uh, one of Mises' characteristics of the promoter is that the promoter is particularly alert, is on the ball, right? whereas the rest of us maybe you know, go about our daily business missing many potential opportunities to engage in business activity at a profit. Uh, because we're not interested, because we're distracted. For whatever reason, we don't have this particular faculty of awareness. Um, at the same time, Kirzner very strictly distinguishes his entrepreneur from the entrepreneur promoter who owns capital. So Mises' entrepreneur is also a capital owner who invests resources in anticipation of uncertain gains and may, as, may well realize a loss by investing capital in ways that end up generating you know, less economic value than the value of the capital goods if invested in some other way. Kirzner abstracts away from ownership and, and argues for a kind of pure entrepreneurship that has nothing to do with factor ownership, but is purely alertness or recognition and nothing else. Um, I think this is a little bit different from uh, Mises' own formulation uh, in human action. Notice that for Kirzner, uh, the, sort of the key phenomenon or variable, if you like, to be explained is not profit and loss. Indeed, Kirzner doesn't really talk about loss at all. He only talks about opportunities realized or seized. But Kirzner's main focus is on, it, it, his, his, his goal is to explain equilibration. In other words, if you think about uh, you know, so, uh, commodity speculation, to use the same example from before, right? If the market is in, in a kind of a long run equilibrium where uh, you know, one unit of uh, a, a commodity sells for the same price, uh, all trades are executed at the same price, less any differences in transportation costs or whatever, 
uh, then there are no opportunities for arbitrage, right? However, if the market is in disequilibrium and the price is higher in market A uh, than in market B, even taking into account transportation and storage and so on, then you can realize a profit, right, by buying in market B and then selling in market A. But the point is, the arbitrageur, the mere act of buying up the good in the market where the price is low will tend to do what to the price? Tend to drive it up, right? Then selling the good in the market where the price is high will tend to drive the price down. And once the prices are in equilibrium, once the market has equilibrated, there are no more of, this, there are no more of these arbitrage opportunities left. Okay, so Kersner's objective is to explain how is it that markets in disequilibrium have a tendency to, to move towards an equilibrium state, okay? What is it about the nature of opportunities that, that makes them tend to go away as they are exploited and seized, right? So Kersner's theory of the entrepreneur is an add-on to his general theory of the market. He's invoking the entrepreneur to explain why markets equilibrate. This is a slightly different explanatory aim from uh, the one, uh, one you find in other uh, parts of the Austrian literature. Now, I should, of course, mention uh, Joseph Schumpeter, who, I mean, is sort of an Austrian by birth, right, is a, is a literal Austrian and was educated by Bombavirk at the University of Vienna, but in, in many ways is, is closer to the Valrasian general equilibrium approach in economic theory than he is to the Mangarian approach. So Schumpeter is not typically considered an Austrian economist in the sense that we talk about the Austrian school, but he did make some very important theoretical contributions in a number of fields, in particular to the theory of entrepreneurship. But again, Schumpeter's perspective is slightly different from that of Kersner and of Mises. Um, I've, I have a picture of, Sch picture of Schumpeter on his horse which is an inside joke for some of you who may know that uh, Schumpeter was also a very, uh, very brash fellow and was uh, uh, liked to make sort of outlandish pronouncements to get attention, one of which uh, he made in Vienna was that uh, he, he used to say when he was older that as a young man uh, he, uh, he wanted to become the best horseman, the best economist, and the best lover in all of Vienna. But sadly, he had only achieved two of the three. Um, <laughs> and it's, you know, it's left to the listener to try to guess which, which two. But uh, Schumpeter introduced the concept of, of the entrepreneur in his very important book on economic development uh, in the early 20th century, uh, right around the same time as Mises' theory of money and credit. Uh, Schumpeter's book on uh, uh, the theory of economic development was an attempt to uh, incorporate notions of economic change, of innovation in particular, into the more general Valrasian equilibrium model uh, of which, in which Schumpeter was, uh, uh, of which Schumpeter was sort of invested, the, the model that he, that he clung to. And so he described the entrepreneur not as an equilibrator, as in Kersner, not as the bearer of uncertainty, as in Mises' entrepreneur, but rather as the, an agent that, in, that introduces new products, services, processes, sources of supply, et cetera, thus disturbing an existing equilibrium. So Schumpeter preferred the Valrasian model as the explanation of sort of day-to-day -day resource allocation. And he was a Valrasian in price theory, thus, in other words, an equilibrium theorist. Yet he recognized that in the real world there was economic growth, right? That there was innovation, that economies changed, that they t uh, many became more prosperous over time. How can you explain change, economic change, in, a, in an equilibrium, Valrasian equilibrium framework? Well, Schumpeter introduced the, the entrepreneur as a kind of exogenous shock, to use modern uh, technology, a sort of deus ex machina who disturbs the existing equilibrium by introducing something new, after which the economy quickly returns to a new equilibrium that represents a higher standard of living or an improved you know, state of technology uh, or whatever. Um, so while, while Kersner's entrepreneur is an equilibrator, Schumpeter's entrepreneur is clearly a disequilibrating force. 
Hence, you, you may have heard the famous phrase associated with Schumpeter's theory, creative destruction. You hear people talk about a capitalist economy as characterized by creative destruction, meaning as new products, new services, new firms uh, come into the market, old products, old services, old firms are you know, sort of pushed out. Okay? So as the, as the capitalist economy, market economy creates new things, it also destroys some of the old. This is a concept that is, can be traced directly back to Schumpeter's theory of economic development. Now, I've argued in, in, in several papers and in the book that I mentioned before that uh, Mises' own view is actually much closer to that of the American economist Frank Knight, who is not a member of the Austrian school uh, by any stretch of the imagination, but who, a very famous uh, U.S. economist who's known primarily for his theory of profit and for developing the distinction between uncertainty and risk. Uncertainty and risk. What Knight had in mind is two different ways of characterizing an unknown future. So there are some cases in which we don't know exactly what's going to happen tomorrow, but we, we, if you like, we sort of know the parameters of the problem. We know the set of things that could possibly happen tomorrow, and we have a good way of calculating the likelihood of each one of those things. We just don't know exactly which one is going to happen. Right, so think about, you know, uh, I could, I, rolling a die, okay? So I don't know which number is going to come up, but if it's a normal die, I know there are six of them. And if it's, you know, if, if, it's, if it's a fairly weighted die, I know that the probability of any particular number coming up is one over six. Okay, so those of you who've taken courses in probability theory know that, you know, you can calculate an expected value under conditions like that. Okay, so I don't know exactly what's going to happen, but I, I have a very good way of formalizing the problem. And it's, it's fairly straightforward what a, you know, quote unquote, rational decision maker would do. By contrast, according to Knight, there are other situations where we don't even know the range of possible outcomes, much less have any way to assign meaningful probabilities to them. Okay, so, you know, uh, I, I'm going to introduce a new little remote control clicker device into the market. You know, what's the probability that I will make money? Well, I mean, that's a fundamentally different kind of problem from saying what's the probability that a number will come up, uh, you know, at Vegas, uh, spinning a roulette wheel or something like that. Okay, so Knight, Knight argued that, uh, that, that entrepreneurs uh, have a particular faculty of anticipating what future conditions will be like. Knight called it judgment. Judgment was the word used by Frank Knight to describe a kind of decision making under conditions of true, radical, genuine uncertainty that uh, was certainly not just chance, it wasn't purely random, but yet it also cannot be formalized in a sort of, you know, a, 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 as a mathematical decision problem with, with expected values and calculating probabilities and so on. It's something else. It's a kind of an intuition, if you like, it's a set of beliefs about the way things will come out that entrepreneurs know but cannot articulate formally in a way that could be copied by others. Um, Mises, without referring to Knight specifically, builds on this notion, this distinction between risk and uncertainty. Professor Hulsman mentioned last night that Mises had a younger brother, Richard, uh, who was a very famous probability theorist. The Knightian distinction between risk and uncertainty is actually kind of a, a poor man's version of Richard von Mises' distinction uh, between what he called class probability on the one hand and case probability on the other. So Mises is really following in the direction of, uh, Ludwig von Mises is following in the direction of Richard von Mises in adopting this particular approach to probabilities. So what uh, Richard called case probability is very much akin to what Knight called uncertainty. And what Richard von Mises called class probability is very much like uh, Knight's notion of risk. So this idea, th the point is that if we could parameterize all future outcomes in terms of mathematics, if we could put them in formal models, and everyone could sort of calculate expected values, well then everyone would take basically the same, people would make the same decisions. Whereas if the future is genuinely uncertain, then people have to make decisions about investment without being able to follow any kind of a formal rule. 
Okay, and that is the act of the entrepreneur in Knight's system. Now again, Knight's main objective was not really to explain entrepreneurship per se, but to distinguish among different income categories as we've, been, uh, as we've, as we've discussed uh, earlier during the talk. Uh, so Knight wanted to distinguish, he wanted to decompose the businessman's income into interest, uh, the sort of the implicit wage that the firm is paying the business person for his or her own labor, and the, the component that is actually pure profit or loss. And Knight pointed out that if there were no uncertainty, there would be no profit. In a world without uncertainty, we would still have wages, we would still have interest, still have factor payments and interest payments, uh, but we would have neither profit nor loss. Profit and loss are uniquely the result of real uncertainty, Knightian uncertainty. This is the notion uh, of, entre of the entrepreneur that Mises adopts, though he doesn't refer explicitly uh, to Knight. Um, you know, uh, what, what is the appropriate stance of public policy, of the government towards the entrepreneur, or towards entrepreneurship? You know, as I've mentioned at the start, there's a lot of interest in explaining, well, look, uh, not, not in explaining, but uh, but policymakers, without really knowing exactly what entrepreneurship is, have this vague sense that it's good, okay? And, and that we should have more of it, okay? And that there's something they can do to, to bring about more of it. They can, you know, which of course, by increasing taxes and you know, giving money to certain favored groups, they can stimulate more entrepreneurship. Well, if we think about entrepreneurship systematically, as we've been doing today, we realize that, in fact, things are much more complicated than that, right? One of the main things that government does which hampers or hinders the act of the entrepreneur is uh, credit expansion, okay? By engaging in credit expansion, uh, this makes the price mechanism, it, it makes prices less reliable indicators to entrepreneurs of relative scarcities and shortages. Okay, it makes it more difficult for entrepreneurs to perform economic calculation because the prices of present goods that entrepreneurs compare with the anticipated prices of the future goods they hope to produce are, are, are distorted, are impeded, are corrupted, as it were, by uh, the increase in credit that distorts relative prices. Okay, so uh, uh, we usually think of uh, uh, you know, credit expansion purely in terms of the business cycle, right? but even, in, even if we think about the financial crisis, uh, the recession, and so on as Austrians, right, we often find ourselves speaking this language. Right? We say, well, there was, there was malinvestment, uh, you know, too many resources were being invested in housing relative to other economic activities. Entrepreneurs made investment decisions that they would not have made in the absence of these various distortions uh, to, to, to money and credit markets. Well, really what we're saying is that entrepreneurs, uh, that, that, that it was much more difficult for entrepreneurs to perform economic calculation because of these government actions in money, money and credit markets, okay? Um, you know, bailouts, subsidies, and so on, hinder the market process of rewarding the more effective entrepreneurs, okay? Uh, if, if you've never read it, I highly recommend Mises' short monograph, Profit and Loss, which appeared uh, in his uh, 1952 collection, Planning for Freedom. Uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful introduction to Mises' general approach uh, to the market, as uh, uh, explains the process of economic calculation. And also, uh, puts forth Mises sort of, if you like, Mises' theory of the market process itself. I mean, the term market process is used quite a lot in contemporary, in some contemporary Austrian discourse. It's not a term that Mises uses in his writings. He doesn't sort of talk so much about the market process or sort of evolutionary, adaptive concepts of economic activity through time, with this one exception. The only place Mises does talk, does use that kind of language is when he explains how under co conditions of competition, entrepreneurs are competing with each other for the use of scarce resources, and some are better at it than others, right? And so over time, in a market economy, there's a systematic tendency 
for those who are particularly good at performing economic calculation, who exercise good judgment in the, in the Knightian sense of that term, to be, in a sense, rewarded with access to more capital. Right? So successful entrepreneurs find that their command over capital resources increases. They can expand their activities. They can make their businesses grow. They can start new businesses and so on. Whereas entrepreneurs who are systematically poor at anticipating future consumer wants, who are not very effective at performing economic calculation, uh, who do not have good judgment about the future, tend to see their capital stock you know, uh, diminish. Right? And eventually, they can't be entrepreneurs anymore because they don't have any access to resources. So there's a kind of competitive selection process among entrepreneurs. And for that process to be effective, it must be the case that the good entrepreneurs are rewarded and the bad entrepreneurs are, in this sense, penalized. Now, obviously, if you're a bad entrepreneur with good connections to policymakers, and your response to losing money is to appeal for some kind of a handout and to get, uh, 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 you know, and to get a big government check. I'm talking to you, AIG, General Motors, Citibank. You know, the list goes on and on, right? This obviously it impedes the market's ability to direct resources, to put resources in the hands of entrepreneurs with the most skill. Okay. So any attempt to subsidize particular firms, to penalize other firms but through the political process is simply making the economy structure of production less appropriate for satisfying consumer wants uh, uh, in the best possible way. Um, you know, what, what about specific government programs that are designed to make more entrepreneurs or to sort of encourage entrepreneurship? So, you know, a lot of uh, the federal government has funding and a lot of state governments have funding for entrepreneurship training various sort of small business uh, incubators and so on that are funded with public dollars that attempt to give people classes and, and sort of help them assemble resources, people who want to start their own companies. Okay, first, notice that this is not at all consistent with the generic notion of the entrepreneur or even Mises' broader notion, a uh, more specific notion of the promoter entrepreneur because the promoter entrepreneur is not just someone who wants to start a brand new company you know, a, a mom and pop store, but uh, you know, Bill Gates cannot go to the Small Business Development Center and get public funding or whatever. So th this, this is money that goes to a, a particular and very idiosyncratic you know, kind of entrepreneur, what we might call entrepreneur. Um, but look, I mean, uh, the kind of skills that make one a successful promoter are not the kind of skills that we can typically teach in classes that we, we can write down in, you know, Entrepreneurship for Dummies books, right? Otherwise, anyone could do it, right? So I have students who ask me all the time for advice on running a business and they want to start a new company and so on. I mean, if I knew, why in the world would I tell them, okay? <laughs> Unless they're paying me a very big, you know, consulting fee, um, I would just invest in the venture myself, or I would, I would start the company myself, right? Um, there's actually some great quotes from Mises about entrepreneurship, in, me, in his sense, being something you know, that cannot be learned or taught, right? It's something innate, it's something intrinsic. Now, it may be the product of experience, but it isn't something that we can dissect and parameterize and put down into a recipe that anyone can follow and be good at it, okay? Uh, you know, there are all kinds of government programs to uh, provide uh, subsidized R&D or prizes based on, you know, funded out of taxpayer dollars for particular innovations. But again, none of those things uh, w w stimulate entrepreneurship in the true, uh, in the sense that we've been talking about it today. I mean, the best thing that the, that the government can do is to help provide an environment in which entrepreneurs and specifically promoter entrepreneurs can flourish, right? So that means you know, stable money, security of property, secure property rights, economic freedom, and so on. In an environment like that, entrepreneurs can flourish. So the best thing the state can do is to quit messing that up, <laughs> right? Is to stop intervening in, uh, stop, stop credit expansion, uh, to stop uh, uh, violating the security of property rights and to reduce its amount of uh, economic intervention. Thanks very much. It's time for dinner. So let's go.